there was a real stigma because of the fear. I remember once falling down and the teacher didn't even try and help me back up. I think they were afraid of us too. So it was just absolutely horrible. What makes the heart of a human rights warrior? For Marilyn Schuler, it was two early encounters of discrimination. First was contracting polio at the age of 10. Before, a child like other children, and after, somehow different, that gave her lifelong empathy for victims of discrimination. And second was watching her father tutor young African-American men in math to help their job prospects. From this, she learned that often victims of discrimination simply need a helping hand. She married, had children, was elected to the Boise School Board, and helped lobby for kindergartens in Idaho. In 1978, she began her real life's work, 20 years as director of Idaho's Commission on Human Rights. To confront the existence of the Aryan Nations, a white supremacy group in North Idaho, Marilyn helped form the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment in 1987. In the 90s, she was a co-founder of the Idaho Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial in Boise, the only one of its kind in the nation. Almost every human and civil rights group in Idaho recognizes her achievement. Just months before her death, it was announced that she would be the Idaho Voices for Children 2017 Children's Champion for the state. She became, as one former governor said, Idaho's moral compass. As one of her friends wrote, Idahoans can honor Marilyn Schuler's memory by standing up for what is right, what is inclusive, and what is respectful for all human beings. Arriving as religious refugees in the mid-1800s, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons, moved to the Idaho Territory to rebuild lives and communities. What they found included extreme prejudice and a century of legal persecution. The laws condemned polygamy, though few Idaho Mormons actually practiced it. Nevertheless, the legislature made it illegal for any Mormon to vote, creating the Mormon Test Oath in 1884. The oath stated, elected county officials were required to swear that they were neither polygamists nor believers nor members of any organization encouraging such practices. The oath was a way to prevent Mormons from gaining political power. The state also prevented Mormons from holding office or serving on juries. Congressman Fred Dubois boasted he could get Mormons convicted of anything. Simply, there would be no Mormons on the jury. Though some Mormons denied their LDS faith, they were still prohibited from voting. Samuel Davis, wanting to cast his ballot, took the oath denying he was Mormon. He was arrested for election fraud. The conviction was upheld by the United States Supreme Court. In 1889, Idaho law further restricted voting. No one could vote who had ever belonged to a religion that had ever condoned polygamy. In 1890, American LDS leadership outlawed polygamy. Still, anti-Mormon language remained in the state's constitution until a 1982 legislatively referred amendment was approved, removing old voter disqualification requirements.
Pearl Harbor, the U.S. naval base on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, was bombed by the Imperial Japanese Navy on December 7, 1941. The surprise attack destroyed some 20 ships and more than 300 airplanes on the U.S. Pacific Fleet, inciting fear and hatred toward Japanese people. The following day, Congress declared war on Japan. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which granted military authority to demand the forced removal of anyone of Japanese ancestry living along the West Coast and in the Alaska Territory. Across the country, sentiments were clearly expressed. Some Japanese Americans had less than a week to put their affairs in order. Many lost their homes, businesses, and farms. They were allowed to bring to camp only those possessions they could carry. From infants to the elderly, two-thirds of those uprooted from their communities were United States citizens assigned to live in 10 U.S. government war relocation centers. Located in a stark desert area near Twin Falls, Idaho, the Minidoka War Relocation Center held nearly 10,000 internees in hastily constructed tar-papered barracks. Surrounded by barbed wire, living conditions were harsh, with mud and extreme cold in winters, dust and intense heat in summers with little privacy. These innocent political prisoners, convicted of no crime, struggled to maintain a sense of dignity and order. While incarcerated at Minidoka, 950 Japanese American men and women enlisted to serve in the U.S. war effort through combat and military intelligence and as nurses and doctors. They fought the Germans in Europe and received much recognition for their bravery while their families remained under guard. Today, a barrack block stands as a tragic reminder of the experience that interrupted and forever changed the lives of those confined. Elected in Idaho, Moses Alexander became the first practicing Jewish governor in the United States in 1915. Born in 1853 in what is now Germany, Moses emigrated to America at the age of 14, making his way to Missouri to work in a relative's clothing store. Moses eventually married Helena Kastner, a Christian immigrant who converted to Judaism and in 1891, they made plans to move west. Charmed with Idaho, the Alexanders settled in Boise and opened their first clothing store, Alexanders, which became a downtown mainstay. The reputation of the store elevated Moses' community profile. His leadership and influence on the city ran deep, including his two terms as the city's mayor and his successful run as governor from 1915 to 1919. In the late 1890s, the Alexanders, along with 23 other Jewish families, formed a Jewish congregation and collected funds to build a synagogue, which stands today as the oldest continuously used synagogue west of the Mississippi. The building was added to the U.S. National Register of Historic Places in 1972. With the support of congregation member Gail Spizer, the effort to establish an Idaho observance of Holocaust remembrance became a reality in 1982, when Governor John Evans signed a proclamation establishing the first statewide observance. 
An annual ceremony has taken place ever since. In 2003, reflecting the growth of the Boise Jewish community and the need for additional space, the Ahavath Beth Israel Synagogue was physically moved from its original State Street location to where it now stands on the Boise bench. During its six-hour procession through the streets of Boise, the congregation and community members traveled to the sounds of traditional klezmer music and stopped to pay respects to one of its very own founding members at the grave of Moses Alexander in Morris Hill Cemetery. As a young girl, Mari Carmen Egurola experienced the ravages of war when her Basque town of Guernica, Spain was destroyed in the spring of 1937 by the German and Italian armies fighting the Spanish Civil War. Mari Carmen and millions of other war refugees suffered losses of loved ones and their homes while being accused of treason and experiencing political, intellectual, and religious deprivation. The citizens of Guernica were not allowed to embrace their cultural traditions, language, nor education. So Carmen and her family were forced to learn about their heritage in more covert ways, which ignited her determination to preserve her Basque identity no matter what. In 1953, Mari Carmen married Teodoro Totorica Guena, and the couple immigrated from Spain to Idaho, where they raised their large family. It was a great revelation to Carmen when she learned that Boise, the international sister city to Guernica, had a growing Basque population and a civic center for Basque immigrants. Carmen later became an integral member of the Basque Center, where she contributed her time as a teacher and a singer in the choir, and eventually becoming the president of the Basque community, proudly serving her ancestry. I am Mary Carmen. Franco's death allowed the creation of the democratic systems and an autonomous Basque community inside of Spain. I visit my Basque family often, and I am thankful for the incredible developments in my homeland. However, there is still work to do. I am adamant that we speak out against aggression. We must evolve as humans and act to prevent suffering. The rigorada verba egitie, on engelsan contra, iracustie eta errespetus alkar visitie, eta idea bardinekin bata bestieri entzutie. Erected in 1956, on a mesa east of the city, the steel cross on Table Rock marked the end to a sad and scandalous time in the history of Boise. Some say it was intended to show this was a city of moral purity. In the fall of 1955, three men were accused of engaging in sexual acts with teenage boys. Each was arrested for lewd conduct with a minor. The three arrests led to a citywide panic and witch hunt. The city vowed to crush the monster of homosexuality by casting a wide net for such activity. Though scores of men were questioned, only 17 were arrested and 16 convicted. It was a collective trauma for the city of Boise. On par with an earthquake or a flood, you didn't have the physical damage,
but the psychological damage was just as immense. In late 1992, concerns with crumbling morals resurfaced when the Idaho Citizens Alliance put an anti-gay rights initiative before the people that would stem the social and spiritual decay. Specifically, the initiative would prevent governments in Idaho from including gays and lesbians in anti-discrimination laws. Opponents to Proposition 1 swiftly organized a Don't Sign On coalition, which became known as the No On One campaign. Pro-LGBT activists understood Idaho's conservative political climate, but appealed to Idahoans' sense of human decency. In November 1994, a majority of Idahoans voted down Proposition 1. Displayed in meeting spaces and store windows throughout the state, Idahoans were reminded, not in our town, not in our state, Idaho is too great for hate. Antonio Tony Rodriguez was a catalyst for the rights of Latinos in Idaho. As a boy, Tony worked in the fields. His family scraped by during the poverty of the Depression. He wasn't allowed to join the Civilian Conservation Corps because he was Mexican-American. However, he served his country in World War II. He opened a barber shop and a restaurant and witnessed the mistreatment of Latinos in Idaho. In many businesses, Latinos were not welcome. Often, Latino farm workers had no bathrooms, they had poor housing, and their children received little education. Rodriguez stepped up to confront the injustice. The Idaho Citizens Committee for Civil Rights, which Tony helped to create, included people of many backgrounds, African-American, Japanese, Mexican, and Native American. Slowly, Legislative successes for minorities grew, but Antonio Rodriguez died before he could witness many of them. In 2015, the city of Wilder elected Idaho's first all-Latino city council and mayor. The inclusion of Latinos in Idaho government is a testament to Tony's enduring legacy. The words we use are profoundly powerful. They allow us to connect with one another and have the potential to reshape our lives. In fact, the first large wave of Chinese immigrants came to America and here to Idaho upon hearing one word, gold. In 1870, Chinese miners in the Idaho territory outnumbered the white miners, representing almost one third of the total population. Some people feared this, believing the Chinese miners were taking their work. Words were used as weapons. Words were written into laws to strip away the rights of Chinese immigrants. They were paid less for the same work. They could not marry non-Chinese. They could not vote. They could not own land. And they were prevented from becoming American citizens. Ultimately, the United States passed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 to bar anyone Chinese from entering the country. The only immigration restriction passed targeting a specific ethnic group. 
Not until the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act were Chinese permitted to enter the country again. Although Chinese immigrants are now allowed into the United States, they are not always welcomed. A new generation of demeaning and racist words has emerged. Whether used intentionally or not, words have meaning. They are most dangerous when someone does not realize what they say is harmful. Promoting stereotypes through word choice can lead to discrimination and injustice. Our stories teach us that we must always work for a time when there will be no evil, no racial prejudice, a time when spiritual, physical, mental, and social values are interconnected to form a complete circle. From the 1890s to the 1930s, the U.S. government and various religious groups often coerced or removed Native children from their homes. Placed in boarding schools, the children were forced to learn white ways. Rules were designed to strip the Indian identity from each child. Children were assigned American names. They were not allowed to speak their native language in class or to each other. They could not dress in their traditional clothing or participate in cultural or religious practices. For native children, the complete circle was being broken. Children were schooled in the English language, Western or European customs, and vocational skills. They were taught that their culture was wrong or bad and learned their history from a white perspective. In many schools, insufficient food and inadequate toilet facilities led to illness and sometimes death. Buried far from their families, every school had a graveyard. Upon graduation, many children were indentured to a white family for three years. Native culture and customs skipped whole generations when children were denied the opportunity to learn from their parents and elders. The attempt to strip native culture impacted whole generations. Children who returned home often did so with their sense of identity traumatized. Tribal leaders struggled to retain their language. Language revitalization is at the heart of the contemporary American Indian movement, which wants Native communities to be proud of their cultures. Members of the tribe are a valued resource, volunteering time in classrooms to help integrate traditions and pass down information. Statewide, powwows are held to enrich knowledge and appreciation for Native tribal customs and culture. Everything on the earth has a purpose, and every person a mission. This is the Indian theory of existence. I learned English by hiding in a bathroom, reviewing the vocabulary that I picked up from the American movies. In my world, learning English was not something that women was supposed to do, but I felt like I had an American woman inside me, fighting to get out. American movies were driving force. In every film I watch, I saw the themes of freedom and justice surface time and time again. Boise's first Syrian refugee, Asma al bukai taught herself English in Damascus. When the war began in 2011, her husband and two sons were abducted. 
Her boys returned, her husband did not. With bombs falling and Syrians dying, Asma and her sons fled, beginning their harrowing life as refugees in Egypt before resettlement in the United States. They arrived in Boise in November 2014. I was inspired by the spirit of the Americans, working hard and not giving up. This is how I wanted to live my life and how I wanted to raise my children. New challenges awaited them. One night, her 16-year-old son was approached by an intoxicated stranger who asked if he was Muslim. When he replied, yes, he was assaulted. Despite the harassment and relying on her faith in education to overcome ignorance, Asma began to speak out, addressing the misconceptions about and lack of tolerance for both Muslims and refugees. She added her voice and experience to an Idaho Muslim community originating from more than 50 countries, including Afghanistan, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Bangladesh, Congo, Iraq, Kenya, Pakistan, Somalia, Sudan, Tanzania, Turkey, and Uzbekistan. Asma endeavored to let people know Syria and let people love Syria as she loves the United States. Granting interviews about the refugee vetting process, she confronted stereotypes and faced frowns with smiles. Asma's life in Boise is dedicated to service as a case manager, where she assists other refugees transitioning to their new lives as new Americans. We can change the world to be a better world, and we can keep this country very safe. We are human, and we should love each other because we are human. Love gives you more power than anything. As the Quran said, Alam takun ardullahi wasi'atan laka litajida arda lil malja. Was not the earth of God spacious enough for you to flee for refuge? I was six years old and seated at the table in our North End Boise home when my mother shouted out. There was a fire in our yard and the flames were licking a wooden cross. She insisted that the charred cross be displayed on our front porch for the entire community to see. It was 1957 and we weren't going away. Black protests against race-based treatment emerged alongside the earliest accounts of discrimination in Idaho. These defiant acts generally involved individuals who stood their ground when challenged. In June of 1870, following the passage of the 15th Amendment, which granted black men the right to vote, John West, one of Boise's first black residents, insisted, while being well armed, that reluctant poll workers accept his ballot. He cast his vote. In 1893, a black Pocatello business owner, Colonel Steptoe, challenged a vagrancy charge up to the state Supreme Court. Vagrancy charges were often manufactured to keep blacks out of certain areas. He lost the appeal. In 1916, Reverend William Riley Hardy, founder of the St. Paul Baptist Church, led a small group before Boise City Council to request the removal of several particularly racist scenes from the Klan praising film, Birth of a Nation, before being shown in the local whites-only theater. In July 1919, Reverend T.J. Ross, with two others from Pocatello's African Methodist Episcopal Church, purposefully tested the segregation policy at a whites-only cafe. When refused service, they sued. The lawsuit failed. Years later, in April 1968, Outrage over the reluctance of the governor's office to lower the flag following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led to Boise's first major civil rights protest. Drawing approximately 700 people to the Capitol steps with black leaders calling for a tougher civil rights law and the creation of the Idaho Human Rights Commission to enforce it. 
the law passed in 1969. Idaho's first black elected official was Pocatello City Councilman Thomas Les Purse in 1973. He became mayor in 1976. Sitting at that dinner table in 1957, I could not have imagined that in 2010, I would become the first black elected official to the Idaho House of Representatives and in 2012 to the Idaho Senate. As Alice Walker wrote, the most common way people give up their power is thinking they don't have any. From the beginning, Idahoans with disabilities have had to fight for their rights to share the same space as people without disabilities. Over the course of Idaho's history, people with disabilities have been seen as the other. They've had to attend other schools, work in other places, and live in other residences. The history of institutions in Idaho serves as a painful reminder what can happen when people are denied the opportunity and support to live fully within their communities. In 1886, four years before Idaho was granted statehood, State Hospital South, then known as the Idaho Insane Asylum, was established in Blackfoot. The individuals who were sent to the institution were required to labor in fields, work in barns, and toil in hen houses. People lived and worked in poorly ventilated buildings with many fire hazards. By 1918, State Hospital North had opened in Orofino and the Idaho State School and Hospital had opened in Napa. As the years passed, conditions worsened. The institutions were overcrowded and did not have sufficient funding to provide for the residents limited medical care was available. Individuals were subject to physical abuse and people starved. Individuals with disabilities, along with their family and friends, brought changes to federal and state laws. The lives of people with disabilities began to change with the onset of community-based services and accessible spaces. Despite the changes, the desire to classify people with disabilities as the other still exists. Many Idahoans continue to advocate for the right to receive support, to fully participate in the community, to go to school, to work, and to live next door. This is what community should look like, a place for all to live out their dreams and potential. Idaho's history serves as a grave reminder of what happens when society is not inclusive, when people are labeled and classified as the other. We must continue to push for inclusion as neighbors, as family, and as members of the community. There is no other, there are only people. To ignore hate groups, even though they usually include relatively small numbers of people, is to miscalculate the impact that they can have on a community. 
Idaho has sometimes been perceived as a racist state. The Aryan Nations, a neo-Nazi group, began building a compound in North Idaho in the 1970s. It became a beacon for other racists. Bill Wasmuth, a Catholic priest born and raised in Idaho, spoke up. A charismatic speaker with a clear, resonant voice, Wasmuth became the leader of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations in 1984. The group stood in visible opposition to the white supremacists. In 1986, Aryan Nations members detonated four bombs in the Coeur d'Alene area, one of them in the back of Wasmuth's home. Well, I take some pretty strong stands on some things, and that might be part of the reason. Other than that, I really don't know. He became even more vocal in his battle against hate groups. In 2000, Wasmuth was a key force in a civil lawsuit that bankrupted the Aryan nations and caused them to abandon the compound. The land is now a designated peace park. Wasmuth dedicated his life to human rights after he left the priesthood, married, and moved to Seattle. When he died in 2002, Governor Dirk Kempthorne called him an early voice for human rights and human dignity in our state. Named in honor of his courage and leadership in the face of hatred, the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights, home of the Idaho Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial, educates classrooms and communities throughout the state in upholding the ideals for which Bill Wasmuth fought. Saying yes to human rights is the best way to say no to prejudice and bigotry.